So if you take your Bibles and open to the book of 1 Timothy, it's okay. He's just, he's just echoing what everybody else feels when I start to preach. Oh, no, it's actually happening. He thought he might give us the day off. No. All right. First Timothy chapter 5. This morning we're going to be looking at verses 19 down through verse 25. So we'll read those together. Don't accept an accusation against an elder unless it is supported by two or three witnesses. Publicly rebuke those who sin so that the rest will also be afraid. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing out of favoritism. Don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder and don't share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Don't continue drinking only water but use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Some people's sins are obvious, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others surface later. Likewise, good works are obvious, and those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden. So, <coughs> excuse me, you know, you, you read this passage in 1 Timothy, and some of it really seems to flow, right? Like you have the accusation against an elder, and you're like, oh, okay, I, I can follow that. Uh, you know, we're supposed to, we're supposed to uh, you know, uh, to do things without prejudice, without favoritism. I can, I can see that. Don't, don't be too quick to point anyone as an elder. Okay, all right, I can see that. Um, don't share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. I can see that. Uh, he, he references using wine for the sake of your stomach for Timothy, and we might want to argue over exactly what that means, but you know, then he comes to back to some people's sins are obvious, uh, some are not obvious, but they'll come out later, same with good works. And we can say, okay, yeah, I can kind of see that. And if you, if you just take this passage in 1 Timothy and you only take it line by line and you don't take it in the context, you can see lots of good little things that kind of makes sense. If you try to say, oh yeah, I can see that. Oh, I can see that. But when you put them all together like God did and you try to put them into what is God teaching through these all put together? Well, I don't know. Why, why are all these together? Well, I don't know. Well, why, why did he put them right here? Well, I don't know. Maybe he couldn't find, some, maybe, maybe he couldn't find anywhere else to put them. Right? You know, right? And, and if, you were to, if you were just to take, let's just say that you took the part about alcohol out, right? And so you're like, okay, he's been talking about church leadership before this, right? In verse 17, he's talking about the uh, uh, good elders should be considered worthy of an honorarium. And in verse 4, uh, you know, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And so then he goes into don't, don't accuse an elder, don't accept an accusation against an elder. So we're continuing with the elder thing, right? And you can sort of kind of see a connection, uh, but then he throws in the, you know, Timothy, take some wine for your stomach. You're like, it, it all gets discombobulated, right? He's like, oh, okay. I, I don't see the connection, flow, purpose of all this being together. But let me, let me, let me make a simple argument for you here. I'm going to back this up with some scripture. But here's the simple argument, all right? If God had not wanted these together in scripture, he wouldn't have put them together, he could have given them to Timothy at any point, I mean to Paul, in writing to Timothy at any point. He could have put them in any order that he wanted to at any place in any book of the Bible. They wouldn't even have had to be in Timothy. He could have put them in Peter or in Revelation. Right? Christ himself could have taught those exact words and they could have been in one of the Gospels. But God put them here in 1 Timothy because he wanted them in the context and in the, in the direction of 1 Timothy. So the responsibility of you and I is to understand why. All right, if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy, infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God 
may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 says, So we have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you should know this, no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right? And if you look ahead in 1 Peter, which I forgot to jot down the verse, but near the end of, the, of Peter, he says some things in Scripture are hard to understand, and he references Paul's writings. He says our brother Paul has written about such things. Right? So here Peter is saying in the beginning of Peter that all Scripture, is, there's, no, that there's no private interpretation. So God had an intent for the reason that he shared Scripture in the context that he shared it. And even though sometimes even things that God shared through Paul are hard to understand, God had a purpose. Right? So here we're in Timothy and God has given us the responsibility to figure out how this connects and why he gave it to us in this context. So now that we know that, let's walk through that together. I've been working on this for a couple of weeks. I don't think that I have it exactly right. But I'll share with you what I've been learning. And hopefully it helps. So... We already established that verse 17 brings us into the clear context of elders. Now, before that, he's dealing with widows, right? And so if you, have, you have to go back even further to figure out the context. And if you go back further in 1 Timothy, you find that the context is pointing people to Christ. So the instructions about caring for the widows, and in our cultural context, we would say those without any help, those without any assistance, those who have no hope or family, or direction, the, the, the down and outers, right? If you want to use the, the polite term, right? The, those who are just down and out in life. How do you care for those people? Well, there's a reason that we care for them, and there's, a, and, there's a, and there's some instruction as to how we care for them, because in how we care for them, we are pointing people to Christ, right? And so it, also with elders, and understanding who the elders are, which was already addressed, Earlier in chapter 3, we've already addressed who they are. Now that we know who they are and how you treat elders, there's a way that you treat them that points people to Christ. Right? Because our culture understands a position of honor. Even outside the church, the culture understands a position of honor. Right? So from a standpoint of pointing people to Christ, this is not disjointed. It's not just a bunch of random thoughts. It's not just, oh, well, God decided not to put this next to that. No, it was intentional. And so how do we point people to Christ? Well, first, he's caring for those who are down and out, which isn't that where we should start? Right? If we're going to be serving people? Shouldn't we serve those who have no one else to be serving them? Right? That's who we should be serving first. But then he also wants us to understand that when someone's in a position of honor, there is also a way to treat them and to serve them. And because we live in a sinful world and God created this world and he understands how we think, even in our sinful state, he wanted to start with the fact that those who have, and you can listen to this last week, I'm not going to dive in deep today, but that those who are to be honored are honored in part by financial compensation because that's how our world understands honor. All right? So we're just, I'm not, you can listen to last week, I'm not going to dive in deep, but that's the simple overview and now he jumps into if someone is in an honorable position, then they shouldn't be discredited or taken from that honorable position because one person has a beef with them and makes an accusation. Even if the accusation were true, you'd have no way of proving it. So don't accept the accusation against someone in an honorable position because... You can't validate it. And at that point, it's just my word versus their word. And who do you believe? And by the way, I want to be clear about something. 
when this idea about don't bring an accusation against an elder unless it's supported by two or three witnesses, the contextual meaning of this is not a bunch of individual accusations that have no connection whatsoever. All right? This is substantiated accusations about an event, about, about something, one thing that happened. If it happened multiple times, then it should be addressed as well, but it needs to be substantiated by multiple people in multiple times. Like, it can't just be one person said this over here, one person said that over there. There seems to be a connection, so we're going to say that that fits. That's not what's meant in context here, because in context, this was referencing the Old Testament way of of an accusation being made legally in court. And in the Old Testament, the Jews were not allowed to make a legal accusation against somebody unless it was substantiated by two to three witnesses. And when you make a legal accusation against somebody, your legal accusation has to do with an event that took place that can be validated by two to three people. So he's not talking here about smearing somebody through a bunch of individual, unrelated accusations that are just designed to get that person out of their office. That's what our culture, our debased culture, has reverted to when they don't like somebody. When somebody decides either they have too much power or I don't like them, then we'll get a whole bunch of unsubstantiated claims coming from a bunch of different areas, and the whole group is going to believe that there's some truth in it if there's so many. That's not what's addressed here. That's not what God's getting at. Now, I know pastors make mistakes. I know because I live it. I make mistakes, all right? I think sometimes I think the reason that God chose me to be a pastor was to prove to anybody that anybody else can serve God. (laughs) If I could pick Steve to be a pastor, every one of you should know you're able to serve God. (laughs) So, I know pastors make mistakes, but in our culture, the mistakes don't have to be proven for the pastor to be forced to resign or to be fired. If there's just enough of them randomly floating around, then the church gets embarrassed, and the church says, well, our image is being tarnished, and so we have to get rid of that tarnisher of our image. But that's not what God's getting at here. God's getting at if there's real sin and that sin is able to be substantiated and validated, then it should be addressed, and it should be addressed, by the way, not privately. Right? He says, verse 20, if that happens, publicly rebuke those who sin, so that the rest will also be afraid. Hello, if you're in leadership, you're at a higher standard. Simple. You're at a higher standard. So if you're at a higher standard and you break the standard, it can't just be, well, we're going to be really nice to you like we'd be to everybody else and we're not going to embarrass you. It's like, no, you are at a higher standard and you blew it. We're not just going to shove this under the rug. We're not going to try and help you save face. Everybody needs to know this is not acceptable for someone who has a higher standard placed on them in leadership. Well, that should scare you from just continuing in sin patterns. Trust me, it scares me. And why? So the rest will also be afraid. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So if you can substantiate the claim about an elder sinning, make it a big deal. So that everybody else knows that God does not just say, well, because your sins are forgiven, then it doesn't matter if you sin. So go ahead and do what you want. No, absolutely not. Even in the case of an elder. And he goes on to explain this. Remember, he says in verse 21, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to observe these things without prejudice and without favoritism. If you understand what God's getting at here about pointing people to Christ through addressing sin seriously and through making it a big deal when it's an elder, then you better believe we need not show favorites depending on who, which elder is guilty. Right? Isn't that the most logical thing to do when there's somebody that you love and someone that you've looked up to and someone that you've appreciated and they've impacted your life and then you see that they have a sin that needs to be addressed? What do you want to do for them? 
oh, it's not a big deal. We, we all struggle. You struggle. You know what? We like, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to make that a big deal. Well, hello, that's showing favoritism. Because what happens if it, to an elder that you don't like or you don't know? Oh man, nail him. <laughs> so God says, don't show favorites. Not with this. Don't have prejudice for those that you love and that you like. Deal with sin as sin. Do it the way that I told you to do it. Because God's church is more valuable than a spiritual leader. God's church is what he died for. If that spiritual leader is in Christ, then their sins are forgiven, but the church reflects Christ, not the spiritual leader. So the church must address what God says to address and must deal with it the way that God says to deal with it because it's his church. God will protect his church and God will flourish his church when it obeys him. By the way, when I say flourish, I don't necessarily mean make it big, okay? He will further his word. People will come to know him. But that doesn't mean that First Baptist is going to get really big just because we're obeying God. God's going to use us in our capacity for his purpose. That may mean that we grow. It may mean that we shrink. It may mean that we, may, that we, that we stay the same as long as his word is going out and his purpose is being accomplished and people know that here at First Baptist we're doing our best to honor God and honor his word, then he's going to be exalted through this body regardless of the size. So then, as you can imagine, after these instructions, he says in verse 22, don't be too quick to appoint anyone as an elder. Oh, no kidding. If that's the expectations, you bet. No one should be too quick to be appointed an elder. Now, here's why this is important, okay? This happens, I'm going to give you an example that happens all the time, and you've probably been in a church where you've seen this. Somebody comes to a church, and they're new to that church, and they really love God, and they really are excited, and they're really thankful they get to serve there. And it just so happens that they know a lot of Scripture because they've been in other churches and they've, and, they've, and they've studied the Scripture and they know a lot of Scripture and they're, and they're willing to do whatever the church needs. And so they get put into teaching and, and they start to uh, utilize this, uh, the, their study and their gifting and the church really likes them. And within a year or less than two years, you have the church saying, man, this person should be an elder. I mean, they, they are a spiritual leader. Look at them. They are the right kind of person. This is who I want to be like someday. Well, you might be perfectly accurate, but you haven't known them long enough to know where they struggle and how they struggle, and they haven't known you long enough to trust you with sharing any of that. So you really don't know whether or not you're going to have to exercise public discipline of them because you don't know them well enough. You see, knowing somebody, it takes a long time. It takes years. It takes effort. It takes getting together outside of church. It takes growing together. It takes suffering together. It takes working hard together. And you get to know somebody, and suddenly you find out this is the kind of guy, not only do I want to be like, or, or, or a lady, this is the kind of guy I want my kids to be like. I, I want that influence because I see when he fails and I see the Holy Spirit working through his failures. I see when he's sinned against and I see how he's responded to that. I see all these different facets of God working through him. Well, now, it's not just, ooh, he's great, we love him, we want, no, it's, we, we know this person there's no reason that he shouldn't be an elder none whatsoever and so by doing so you protect the elder from public shaming in the church you also protect the church from embarrassment over selecting somebody that they didn't take long enough to get to know now can someone who is serving God make a mistake and slip up and need to be corrected absolutely but if you know that person, you know their character, and you see their humility in response to the Holy Spirit, that means that over time that they can earn the right to be an elder again. 
even after they've been publicly embarrassed because if the Holy Spirit's working through them and they respond to the Holy Spirit and the church sees that, okay, that's the goal is restoration. But don't make it too quick and don't share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. I love how God knows how we think and he throws this in there because of how we struggle with it in our own hearts and minds. I want somebody to lead me who's going to validate my struggles, right? So that my struggles don't make me feel bad anymore. After all, if, 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 if Steve struggles with it, I know he struggles with it. He's failing. I'm failing. Well, he's not going to judge me. I'm not going to judge him. We're going to be at a happy place with each other, Right? Now, this isn't to say that we, shouldn't, that we don't struggle. We all struggle with different sins. We all have times that we fail. But this is about the, the deceitfulness of our own heart, being happy to appoint someone who's going to make us feel good about ourselves. I'm not supposed to share in their sin to normalize it, to make it acceptable. Just because we're all doing it doesn't mean it's not sin. Just because we're all doing it doesn't mean that that's, I mean, that's exactly what Christ died for, but it's not acceptable to say, well, because he died for it, we can all do it. We'll do it together. We'll be fine. No. He says, don't do that. Don't establish those people as elders. Don't think that way. Don't fall to that deception. Now, I'm going to skip verse 22 for a, or verse 23 for a moment. Go down to verse 24. He says, Some people's sins are obvious, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others surface later. Now, if you take this out of context, it's just a general truism that we can all agree with. No doubt. This is just, it's a truism. Yes, it's always true. Some people's sins are obvious. No duh. Some people's sins are going to come and be revealed later. No duh. But in context, he's specifically dealing with who? Oh, someone said it. Elders. Yes, he's specifically dealing and addressing the church's response to elders so that through their elders, they can also be pointing people to Christ. So why would God put that right there except to emphasize that when you're too quick to select an elder, you haven't given time for their secret sin struggles to be made known. Now, maybe you select somebody and you've known them for years, but they've had something hidden for years. Well, when that comes out, address it as a problem. But don't rush into it. Why? Because, well, some sins are obvious, but... Some sins, they surface later. So give some time. Allow the opportunity to get to know someone. This isn't about beating somebody with their sin, but it's about saying as a brother in Christ, hey, one of the reasons that we don't select everybody to be elders is because some people's sins need to be worked on now through the Holy Spirit because you're not ready yet to lead people spiritually because you still have too great of a struggle happening. Oh, well, that's obvious. Okay, I get that in my spirit. I, okay, sure, no problem. But if you say to that person, hey, it's not a big deal. We want you as an elder, and we think you can do a great job. We just love you. We love the way you teach. We love your family. We love this about you. So we're not going to... That's exactly what God is saying. Don't do it. You're setting yourself up for epic failure. Then it says, likewise, good works are obvious. Once again, no duh. And some that, be, that aren't so obvious are going to be revealed later. Once again, no duh. But God's point here is when you're dealing with elders, you're understanding leaders in the church. If somebody's doing the work of God, it's going to have a level of visibility. It's going to. This idea that 
well, I love God and he loves me and we're in our own little corner and no one really knows and no one really should care because it's, you know, it's just private. And if you don't see anything I do for God, you don't hear anything, that's not your problem. It's not your concern. Okay, well, we would call that an immature way of thinking, scripturally speaking, okay? And as a brothers and sisters in Christ, we should encourage somebody to move beyond the immaturity to more mature thinking, that as a body, we're here to go through this together. We're here to struggle together. We're here to rejoice together. We're here to weep together. We're here to laugh together. We're doing this together as a body. And this is where it's safe. This is where it's acceptable. We're not going to judge you because God commands us not to judge each other. We're not going to hold it against you because we've all been forgiven of sins that we shouldn't have been forgiven of. But don't make that person an elder. Hello? Knock, knock. They've got growing to do. Recognize it. Let them know and grow together. And if the Holy Spirit works through them to the point that over years of knowing them, the Holy Spirit brings them to a place that they are qualified to be an elder and the body recognizes the change that the Holy Spirit has brought in them and the, whole, and the body says, that person now qualifies to be an elder, then thank God by God's grace they're ready to do it. Now I need to go back to verse 23 very briefly. It says, don't continue drinking only water, but use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illness. If there was any verse in Timothy that seemed completely out of context, that would be the verse. As a matter of fact, most commentators refer to it as what is literally, literarily known as an aside. All right, so in literary terminology, an aside is separate from the story. It's like, a, like its own little thought bubble, right? It's not part of what's happening. It just got included by the author. It's so difficult to translate this in context or to understand it that most commentators just take it as something else. That's easier. But I don't think God put it in here for us to take the easy road and to say, hey, we're just going to let that be an aside and be its own thing. So think with me for a moment here. There's a reason why God put it here. Right in the middle of dealing with sin with elders and pointing people to Christ. Now, if you and I wrote this, we would tell Timothy be very, very, very careful that when you take wine for your stomach that you don't take too much lest you fall into sin and condemnation and ruin the opportunity to be an elder. That's what you and I would have written if we would have included it at all. But that's not what God says here. He says to Timothy, don't continue drinking only water, but use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illness. All right, I spent time meditating on this. I'm open for some debate. I'm not trying to be dogmatic and right, but I'll share with you what I thought. I think there's a reason God put that there. And I think one of the very important reasons is because there are things that we as Christians like to think are sin and we extrapolate those sins onto the expectations for those around us, including spiritual leaders, so that we can't do them. And if we get caught doing them, we're no longer qualified for spiritual leadership. So one of them would be drinking alcohol. As a matter of fact, it's so unrecommended that sometimes pastors are afraid to even talk amongst themselves about whether or not any of them ever have a drink of alcohol because some of them know they could get fired on the spot if anybody in their church found out that they were actually okay with the idea, much less participated. But what about other things? You know, like in some churches, and the says the pastors often preach against this, but, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the rating on a movie determines whether or not a pastor is able to watch it. Right? And so if a pastor watches a movie with a certain rating level, right, 
right? And in, in conservative circles, we would say R means bad, right? And so if you watch it, well, he's probably not qualified. I mean, I don't know if he should do it. God never addresses movie ratings. And we can make all sorts of arguments about why it's wise to watch certain things and why it's wise to not watch other things, but we're talking about wisdom principles, not sin. Right? We could talk all day about how it's wise because it's a sin to be drunk. It's wise to not take anything. If you never take anything, you won't sin being drunk. Well, hello, sure. Okay, we could all agree that that's the safest place to land. But God never ever says that it's a sin to have a drop of alcohol. It's a sin to be drunk. So we can take the wisdom that God gives and make a sin where God never made a sin. So here with Timothy, who is elder qualified, who's going to the churches, appointing elders, he's traveling around to different churches in different cultural contexts, dealing with different expectations, and I would bet anything that Timothy thought it probably the safest thing to do to just let his stomach hurt and not digest right. That was safer for him than dealing with the judgment that he would face from certain people if he had any wine. Why? Well, because you, you, you don't think there were people in that day that didn't, that, that, I mean, they had people that thought wine was bad. And so here Timothy, as an elder, gets instruction from the Lord through Paul to say, Timothy, in this area, it's not a sin. You know it's not a sin. Your body needs this for your own health, so please be healthful. Do what's good for your body and have a little wine for your stomach. So what is God getting at here? That as we recognize that elders are held to a higher standard, they are not held to such a standard as to, the, as to having sins that God does not make being put on them or expectations about sins. God, God says it's not, he, God never addresses it as a sin, but as a church, we decide it's bad, we decide it's wrong, and therefore the pastor or the elder can't do it. Right here we have God telling Timothy, in the context of sin and elder discipline, take some wine even though you believe it's safer not to do it. So we have God teaching us that we need to make sure that when we address sin, whether it's in the body or with leadership, it doesn't matter, we're all in the same body, that we address sin that God calls sin. And we don't make up things and put things on expectations on people that God does not. So next week, we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy 6. It's going to be another challenging passage dealing with slaves and masters. Uh, so why does God deal with this in Scripture? Because it's been a problem throughout human history. It's not an American problem. It's not a European problem. It's a human problem. So why does God deal with it? Well, because it's a problem that he knows we have, and he gives us some instructions on how to best work through that to still point people to Christ. So we'll be looking at that next week, um, uh, but we're going to close here in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the power of your truth. Lord, we're thankful for the wisdom that you give us in, in recognizing, Lord, that uh, you gave us scripture for a purpose and it's our job to understand why. Lord, we thank you for this truth on the expectations for elders being held to a higher standard um, in that their sin should be publicly addressed when it's able to be proven by two or three people. Um, Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom. Um, Lord, that you would protect those of us who are elders or elder qualified, Lord, to, uh, from the, uh, the sins that would bring us public rebuke. Um, and uh, 
Lord, I pray that you would just teach us all in the body um, how important it is to you that we strive to live in obedience. Uh, and uh, Lord, if anyone here is this morning is struggling with, with knowing what that means or with understanding your love for them and the sacrifice that you made, um, Lord, I pray that um, they would be willing to repent and turn to you, trusting you as Lord and Savior. Um, and uh, Lord, we just ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.